Everything that's written here is written for our edification so that we might have life in Jesus' name. Let's first say a short prayer. Lord our God, this is your word and we are here to hear from you today. And we pray that each one of us would would hear from you and be shaped and molded by your word to us, by the power of your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Mark 13, starting at verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see all these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial to deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days... Pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs, And false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on your guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. And that's Mark 13. Verse 30 is what we're going to 
focus on, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So it's almost like Jesus is saying he's coming back in this generation. Or so some have taken it. Verse 30 has confused a lot of people in, in, uh, in the many years. Um, there's, it's not just in Mark, it's in Matthew and in Luke too. Jesus said these things are not going to pass away, and, or this generation will not pass away until everything takes place. I want, I want us to understand this properly here. First century Christians thought Jesus would return in their lifetime. And, and they did. And you can see this all, all throughout Scripture. The way that, the, way that you know, the epistle writers were talking, it's like Jesus is coming back you know, very soon. We need to be ready at any time. But even in the end of John, um, John 21 Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And then look at this. So the saying spread, oh, not yet, yet. the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Like Jesus is going to come back before he dies. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So they thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. And so these sorts of things, they kind of had that impression. I mean, they obviously were incorrect, but, but there are people today who have said that because of verses like this, that Jesus must have already come back. In fact, I had a relative, my grandpa's brother, who actually believed that Jesus had already returned. He had a lot of other odd beliefs that are not in keeping with, you know, the doctrine of the church that we believe. Um, but he believed that Jesus had already come back. And I would submit to you the next one here, uh, 2 Thessalonians. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. <laughs> it's not happened yet. Um, there are skeptics, you know, people who don't believe, who say that this proves that Jesus was incorrect, that he was wrong. In fact, I, I have a book on one of my shelves that says, uh, before 100 AD, it was clear to everyone that Jesus' prophecy was not going to be fulfilled. He was wrong, in other words. So skeptics use this to say that, well, Jesus obviously was, was wrong. And people, even in recent times, have said, have used this verse to calculate when Jesus is going to come back. How many of you heard of Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth? Raise your hand. Some? A few? Not many? Okay, well, this book came out um, in uh, the 70s, and... It says on top there are 15 million copies sold. In the end, it sold 28 million copies. Um, he basically used this, this verse, this statement by Jesus to say, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Well, he used it. Israel was, Israel was created in 1948. And so Jesus was speaking of that generation. A generation is typically 40 years. That means Jesus is coming back in 1988. And tons of people bought this book and believed that. And I remember people saying, Jesus is going to come back in 1988. Well, it didn't happen. So, what is Jesus saying here? What is he saying? There's actually a, a lot of different ideas about what he could be saying. I'm not going to get into those. In fact, my study Bible here gives five different possible interpretations, but I'm not going to get into the details of all of those, but I'm going to, I'm going to give you just the best, uh, best understanding that I have here. In Mark, when it says generation, it refers to people of Jesus' time. When Jesus talks about this generation, he's talking about the people at his time. The people that he talks to. The people that 
largely heard him, saw his miracles, and rejected him. So I have one example here on the screen. Um, he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? He's talking about people who have seen, they've heard, and they're not believing. They're just stubborn. Verses 1 through 4 of what we read of chapter 13 the disciples, they were in the temple. The temple that they were in, that Herod had built, was considered one of the greatest pieces of, of architecture that existed in the world at that time. It was so beautiful to be in the temple. And we have descriptions of the temple that are just quite amazing from that time. I don't have any in front of me, but it's not, it's not unusual that the disciples were saying, wow, can you believe how, how magnificent these buildings are? The original question was about when the temple would be destroyed. So Jesus, they're admiring these buildings, and Jesus says, yeah, you see all this? Not one stone here is going to be left on another. Every one is going to be thrown over. So verse 4, 1 through 4, the original question is about, okay, well, when is that going to happen? And then Jesus goes on in verses 2 through 23. He describes very well events that lead up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So there's, there's the thing. The temple, or not one stone left on another, everyone thrown down. When will these things be, they ask. And then... He describes, okay, here's what's going to happen before the temple is destroyed. And verses 2 through 23 describe this quite well, actually. A lot of these things can be found in the book of Acts. Um, verse 2, it said, Not one stone here will be left on another that will not be thrown down. This refers to the destruction of the temple. And this was literally fulfilled when the Romans destroyed the temple and they pried apart every stone because every stone had gold in it. They wanted to get at the gold. So there's a kind of an illustration of what the temple looked like at the time and, and uh, it doesn't do justice to it because the people in this picture are super tiny. Um, but all of that was destroyed. The only thing that remains today is a retaining wall on the left-hand side of this picture where there's this little outcropping there. There's a retaining wall there. Those stones didn't have any gold in it, so those were left. Everything else is gone and was gone around at 70 AD when Roman, the Romans came. So that's all that remains of the temple. But verse 9 describes very well the events in Acts. He talks about, they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. That's Acts chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7. He talks about standing before governors and kings for my sake. Paul was before Felix the governor, and he was before King Agrippa in Acts. So again, this describes things that happened before the temple was destroyed. And he talks about how there's going to be great distress that's unequaled from the beginning of time until the end. And we know that the battle for Jerusalem was uniquely horrific. It was really bad. It was very brutal. In fact, when Jesus is about to be crucified, he's carrying his, he's carrying his cross to Golgotha. And he stops and looks at the women who are weeping for him. And it, he said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. It's going to be that bad. Jesus is saying, I feel sorry for you. Really. And from the records that we have at that time, it was said that uh, the terror was so great 
that survivors called those who died first happy. And this is not by, this is by a, a Jewish historian, not somebody who believed in Jesus. Um, it says, he says, the war which the Jews made against the Romans was the greatest of wars. Not only the wars in our times, but of those that were ever heard of, both where cities have fought against cities or nations against nations. So the people who witnessed this battle said, this is, this is the worst thing ever. So again, Jesus' statements fulfilled. The temple is gone. They were fighting for the temple because, well, they thought it, rep it was God's presence. God's going to be there. He's going to defend the temple. Well, the temple building is gone because Christ has come. We have Christ. We don't need the temple anymore. Not the building, at least. When uh, Jesus actually was on earth, he was in the temple, and he was clearing the temple, and they said, what sign do you do? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So, again, the body of Christ is now the temple. Jesus is God's presence among us. The Jerusalem temple building is not the true temple. It says in Hebrews 9, Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. In other words, there are heavenly things and there are earthly things. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are the copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So the temple down here was meant to replicate the temple in heaven. And Jesus, now that he has ascended, has entered that true temple. And he intercedes for us constantly because he lives forever. It's almost as if God took away the temple on purpose to make way for the new temple, which is Jesus Christ and his body, the church, in the world now. The church, which is God's people, is now God's presence on earth. The church is not a building, just so all of you get that straight. The church is not this building. If a tornado came through and knocked this building over, and we still gathered for worship, the temple here would still exist. Because the people are the temple, and wherever we gather for worship, there is the temple. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.19, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? It doesn't say your bodies are temples. It says your body is the temple. When we come together, we are the temple. When we are together. God's people are now God's presence on earth. And it's our job to testify and to witness to who he is. Verses 24 through 27, these describe very well events that could not have yet happened. So then Jesus talks about things that, okay, you, you can't miss these. If these things happen... Yeah, everybody in the world is going to know. This is going to be the front page news everywhere around the world. He talks about stars being, or the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, stars falling, seeing the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory, sending out his angels to gather his elect from the four winds from one end to the other of the earth. I mean, you, you can't miss this. So if anybody says to you that Jesus has come back yet, you, you tell them that when he does come back, nobody will miss it. It'll be evident to everyone around the world. And then, this is interesting, in verses 28 through 30, Jesus says, essentially, you will be able to see it coming. 
you'll be able to see it coming. And then, in verses 32 through 36, he says, you won't be able to see it coming. So he kind of he has two contrasting messages there. You'll be able to see it coming. You won't be able to see it coming. So what's going on here is that Jesus is talking about two different events together. Jesus essentially is saying this. This generation is going to be punished. You will see it coming because I've told you beforehand. This is going to be obvious to you. Here's all of these signs. And then those are recorded in Acts and in other historians throughout the time. You're going to see this coming. This generation that didn't believe is going to be punished. And you're going to see it coming. It's going to, it's, you're going to see it happen. Mark my words. But he also says here in this chapter, One day I will return and everyone will see, but nobody knows when. You must be ready at all times. He's saying both of these things together. And the first century Christians, you could tell they kind of conflated these two. But looking back on it now, it's pretty obvious that Jesus is talking about two different things. He's talking about two different events. And the one that is very relevant for us is this second one. One day I'm going to return and everybody's going to see it. It's going to be front page news. Well, not even news. It's going to be in front of everybody's eyes around the world. And nobody knows when that's going to happen. You have to be ready at all times. So it's not like you can say, well, I'll just wait for the stars to start shaking up. Or the sun did not give its light. And, and then I'll repent and believe. I'm going to live my life how I want right now. No, you better not do that. Because nobody knows when. We have to be ready at any time. He says that last verse. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Stay awake. Repent now. Believe now. Follow Jesus now. Trust him now. Some takeaways for us. <clears throat> the disciples were going to endure some terrible times. And they were going to see it. It was going to be part of their generation. And it wasn't going to be pleasant or pretty. Similarly, events in our lives are going to be scary and disturbing. And if you look back through history, pretty much every age and every generation has things to be really terrified about, and legitimately so. Whether it's a, a Great Depression, or a world war, or communism, or a nuclear war, you know, the H-bomb, or changes in society, a sexual revolution, or the political tensions that we're in, or terrorism. There are things to be worried about all the time, whatever generation you are. And they shift from one generation to the next. There's always things to be worried about. And some things are going to happen that we would much rather not happen. There's going to be, there's going to be terrible things that happen at every generation too. So there's always things that we can be afraid about. There's always things that we can be anxious about. And some of them are going to happen. This is going to be what life is like, and we need to just realize that. We can't, we can't make a utopia, a heaven on earth. Only Jesus can do that. We can't solve the world's problems on our own. We need Jesus for that. So our job, our job in all of this is not, well, fix the world now. Well, we, we can do our own little part and stuff, but our real job is to not stray or fear. That's what Jesus is driving home here. Our job, don't stray. Lots of people are going to try to get you to stray. Don't. Our, we're not to stray. And we're not to be afraid either. You know, you, the, the big scary things are going to happen. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of that. 
At one point, Jesus says, it's not on the screen, but don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, fear the Lord. There's an eternity here. That's what you need to pay attention to. This, this temporal life, it's going to be rough. It's not going to be pleasant in a lot of ways. That's okay. It's okay. Our job is to witness and to persevere. That's what we need to do. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, because it's the Spirit speaking through you. So we need to witness, and we need to persevere. Just hold fast because of eternity that is coming. Jesus is going to come again one day. Let's look at the screen here. How does Christ's return to judge the living and the dead comfort you? In all my distress and persecution, I turn my eyes to the heavens and confidently await as judge the very one who has already stood trial in my place before God and so has removed the whole curse from me. All his enemies and mine he will condemn to everlasting punishment, but me and all his chosen ones he will take along with him into the joy and the glory of heaven. This is what we have to look for, look forward to, rather. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Oh, Lord, our God, Lord, we, we have things that we can worry about in these days, the days before and the days to come. But we pray that we would not be afraid. We pray, Lord, that instead... We would be witnesses for you and that we would persevere and that, Lord, we would see your glory and all that you have said come true. And we pray, Lord, that it would be in our lifetime, that it would come sooner rather than later. But we know that you have a time set and so we put our trust in you. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.